I'm trying to cover the history of drag um, in a very, very short period of time um, in the American context. So I'll just be jumping around a little bit um, and giving you a taste of some of the things that interest me most about the history of drag in America. I want to start off by talking a little bit about the definition of drag and clarifying uh, how I'm going to use the terms female impersonator as opposed to drag queen. Though some people use those terms interchangeably. Um, or more controversially, some people conflate the terms uh, drag queen and drag king and cross-dresser and transvestite and transsexual and transgender, uh, none of which are the subject of this presentation, um, though individuals may certainly lay claim to one or more of these identities. Um, the difference between a drag queen and a female impersonator uh, is a very tricky one, but we might say that for now. A female impersonator is, in a general way, a man who dresses in women's clothes, on stage, or on film as part of a performance um, who models himself on women, whether it's for laughs or whether it's to achieve some sort of dramatic realism. Um, the female impersonator, we might say, is doing drag. But drag queens, by contrast, can do that and more. Rather than modeling themselves after women, drag queens can model themselves after drag queens. Um, they can model themselves off of celebrity icons who have preceded them. A drag queen can be larger than life, uh, can be spellbinding, can command attention. The objective of a drag queen is not usually to blend into the crowd, uh, but to stand out right, as an extraordinary personality with extraordinary style. Um, and a critical facet of the drag queen or drag king is fashion. Drag is a cultural form where art, performance, and fashion combine. But if we step back more than a century, and I'm talking back to the 1850s, um, to the emergence of the term drag, uh, the waters get more muddy. According to one scholar, the phrase putting on the drag originally meant to slow down. Um, it referred to applying the brake on a, in a coach. Um, and then this term seeped into early homosexual slang where it was used to signify uh, the drag on a gown when it rubbed up against the ground. Um, in those days, to go on the drag or to flash the drag meant to wear women's clothes in order to solicit sex from men. Um, the next decades, however, moved that term drag into common theatrical talk. Uh, and it was a, an expression that was years, used to describe the clothes, the skirts, the petticoats that men wore when they played women on stage. Male actors had already played female roles on stage for hundreds and hundreds of years, but this is a moment where drag was used to describe um, what they were wearing. And as we move forward through the late 19th century and into the 20th, I'll pinpoint several examples that will hopefully give you a sense of the shifting terms and conditions under which drag performance and female impersonation took place and how we arrive at our contemporary understanding of the drag king and drag queen. Um, so I'm gonna try and make this work, we'll see. Okay, so uh, a little bit about the tension between the drag queen and the female impersonator. This is from, if you don't recognize it, se season 10 of RuPaul's Drag Race, uh, where there was a controversy between Raven and Tatiana because Raven said, Tatiana wasn't a drag queen. She was just a female impersonator. She didn't have the kind of personality and style that Raven did. Um, but back to the 19th century. <coughs> First of all, and perhaps surprisingly, uh, cultural historians have located some of the earliest instances of female impersonation in America in popular minstrel shows, uh, where usually white men and occasionally black men played coon types like Topsy from Uncle Tom's Cabin or yellow gals or black wenches in blackface. That is, their faces were blackened with, uh, with cork and they were painted up in exaggerated, degrading stereotypes of, of black Americans. Um, and they were low humor acts. Um, but these kinds of sketches in blackface, and you see an example um, of Roland Howard here in blackface and George Griffin uh, playing against him in a minstrel show, uh, those shows, these low humor shows, gradually paved the way for men to play uh, women in burlesque and eventually uh, white women who were pure on stage. Um, these shows would usually end with men removing their wigs and restoring order because it wasn't acceptable, as you might imagine, to continue wearing that drag offstage. 
Uh, second, in the early 20th century, female impersonation found a stronghold on university campuses. Um, and preparatory schools as well, where there were all male amateur dramatic societies, and they would stage comedies and burlesques that featured drag performance. Um, this collegiate drag uh, was present at almost every university across the country, and it persisted even after these universities became co-ed. Um, it still continues at schools in societies like uh, Harvard University's Hasty Pudding Club. The public and the press supported and publicized these kinds of performances. Uh, the, during World War I, both Harvard and Yale instituted regulations that would prevent young men from spending more than one year in skirts uh, because they thought <laughs> it might lead them towards effeminate tendencies. <laughs> Third, uh, the American theater in the early 20th century made room for a different kind of female impersonator on the stage. Um, one of the most famous examples of this is Julian uh, Elthinch, um, who was an actor who appeared in New York in a musical comedy called Mr. Wick of Wickham, where he had to play a college student who disguised himself as a woman. But he was so remarkable in this role that he continued as a female impersonator in plays and on vaudeville. After an extremely successful performance in a play called The Fascinating Widow, uh, in which he was widely admired by female audiences, Elton's decided to capitalize on this fame by advertising cold cream, liquid whitening, and powder, the makeup that he had ostensibly used in his performance. Um, he created a magazine that was called Julian Elton's Magazine and Beauty Hints, um, which appeared in 1913. And he advised women how they might acquire feminine graces. Um, but at the same time, he commiserated with his female audience about how time-consuming it was to primp, uh, how much a corset that he needed to use to um, achieve his fabulous 24-inch waistline, how uncomfortable that was. In addition to these comments on beauty culture, though, uh, he used the magazine to present images of himself as a man. So here you see Julian Elton as a man and as a woman. He talked about uh, his experiences growing up and working on a Long Island farm. Um, he wore a beard and a mustache in some of his images. And these images signified uh, or underscored the pressure he had to affirm his manhood even though he was appearing as a woman. Uh, and a kind of interesting aspect of the magazine was that the advice he gave to women didn't only have to do with beauty. He advised them to train to box, to do muscle building exercises, to cultivate traits like perseverance and industry, which were at that point associated with men. Um, and the costumes that Elton sported were actually pretty regressive because by the early, uh, early 20th century, you had new beauty ideals like the Gibson girl, like the 1914 girl who was called the ambisextress because she had a very slim uh, hips and waistline. Um, and uh, Julian Elton provide women who couldn't fit these idealized beauty uh, body shapes um, with a kind of transitional way of looking um, as uh, we we're dealing with a moment where women are fighting for the suffrage and also <coughs> trying to find more room in the public sphere. So he's a kind of transitional figure for women uh, as a male uh, and as a female impersonator. Uh, additionally, one of the most significant early 20th century performers in drag and one who most anticipates what, what we might find a, a recognizable drag queen uh, is Bert Savoy here on the left. Uh, he was a colorful character who sang in Bowery bars in New York. He was once arrested while he was working as a fortune teller in Baltimore, and at the height of the, his career, he, he died because he was struck by lightning. Uh, after an early and mediocre career, Savoy teamed up with a straight man named Brennan to form the duo Savoy and Brennan, and he cultivated a highly mannered persona that landed him in the Greenwich Village Follies, and he was making more than $1,500 a week in 1916. Uh, yeah. Sporting an enormous red wig, Savoy's wise, cracking character would gossip about her friend Margie uh, and just the dirt, which is where that phrase comes. He would use catchphrases like, you don't know the half of it, dearie, um, and you must come over. Uh, his talk was full of double entendres. So Mae West uh, here, whose use of sexual innuendos often offended traditional ideas and feminine purity, uh, she was said to have borrowed much of her stage persona from Bert Savoy, um, including her famous catchphrase, you come up and see me sometime. Uh, in the newspapers, 
critics were uh, describing Savoy's character as, quote, a gigantic red-haired harlot reeking with corrosive cocktail. The vast vulgarity of New York incarnate and made heroic. She was a Titian haired tart and a brazen hussy who reveled in her libidinous ways in a way no woman could. Um, in other words, they absolutely loved her. <laughs> <coughs> There were also women who gained notoriety impersonating men on and off the stage in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. These included Annie Hindle, a London-born performer who made it big in the United States with her dashing man about town look and suggestive, suggestive songs like, Have You Seen My Nellie? <laughs> and Vesta Tilly, who impersonated a variety of male types but is best known now for perfecting what came to be known as the Tilly style or Tillian uh, male impersonation. Um, this was a soup and fish look, a, a tuxedo with a white tie, the look of an upper class gent um, at an evening party. This formal garb that she sported uh, was a stark cry from the opulence of women's finer even, of Bert Savoy. Uh, it was also a, a costume, though it was plain, that performers could make their own. On the Chitlin circuit, which was the black uh, vaudeville circuit, this is exactly what Gladys Bentley did. And you may be familiar with Gladys Bentley. Yeah. Uh, Bentley, a singer and pianist who drew on the material of blues and jazz singer Bessie Smith, uh, was recognized as an African-American bohemian through the Harlem Renaissance. Uh, she wore a tuxedo. And like Annie Hindle, uh, she eventually married her female lover in a civil ceremony. Uh, an interesting epilogue to Gladys Bentley's tale uh, though, is that um, next, in the next decade, so in the 40s and 50s, she actually repudiated her past as a performer. Um, and in a, in a magazine article in Ebony said that doctors had injected her with female hormones. She had learned how to love men. She got married twice. And in the Ebon, Ebony magazine article, uh, she was washing dishes. Um, so, OK, so <laughs> moving to the mid-century, uh, especially after and during the Second World War, there's this tremendous shift uh, in the circumstances under which drag performance is acceptable. So uh, POW camps during World War II, as well as, as, well as many army regiments uh, stationed in the Pacific where the ENSA couldn't get to the Met Entertainment National Service Association, the organization that toured battalions and provided entertainments to the troop. When they couldn't get there, um, regiments would draw on latent talent at female impersonation um, and get several men to, especially when there were no women around, uh, to perform in a kind of cabaret style, doing impressions of, say, Carmen Miranda and singing popular songs. Um, there are uh, suggestions that in some units, uh, men or soldiers who performed in drag automatically won their sergeant stripes. <laughs> Some of these men uh, ended up seeking uh, careers as professional female impersonators when they returned home, um, but they didn't have much success. In England, this wasn't true. There were some drag performers who ended up becoming popular on the stage, even having shows in the new medium of television, but not so much the case in the United States. In the 50s especially, venues for gender impersonation and drag performance were extremely uh, restricted. Um, they were curtailed by laws like New York Statute 780, which read, uh, quote, an assemblage in public houses or in other places of three or more persons disguised by having faces painted discolored, colored, or concealed is unlawful, and every individual so disguised is guilty of a misdemeanor. However, these laws, which were enforced until the early 1960s, were designed to prohibit continuous drag performance. Um, and allowed for the existence of annual drag balls and fashion shows in large cities. So you can guess what happened about once a year. Um, everyone came out of the woodwork and had a kind of drag revelry. Um, but people who tried to have continuous drag performances faced crackdowns and police raids throughout the 1950s. Most states required that men uh, wear at least three and sometimes as many as five articles of, of male clothing um, to avoid arrest. Um, and this was true even in New York and in San Francisco. Men would be examined as they entered and as they exited a club. The same was true for women. Um, and performers in San Francisco, for instance, who wanted to receive cabaret cards would have to agree to be uh, fingerprinted and photographed by the police in order to do so. So these police raids and harassment took a great toll on clubs and uh, drug performance in general during the 1950s. 
Nevertheless, some companies did promote drag and female impersonation um, as reputable forms of entertainment, uh, most notably the Jewel Box Review, 25 Men and One Girl, <laughs> which became the first integrated drag show uh, when in 1955 they hired a lesbian performer, um, who you have on the right, Storm Delivery, who was an equestrian, a big band crooner, and became the MC for the group. The star of the Jewel Box Review was Thomas Craig Jones, or T.C. Jones. Uh, his show included impressions of Edith Piaf, of Katherine Hepburn, Betty Davis, Tallulah Bankhead, um, and so on. But in order to avoid harassment, the Jewel Box had to appeal to a general public audience rather than a clientele um, of, of homosexuals. And all of its female impersonators had to be over one. They had to arrive in male clothing and leave in male clothing as well. Meanwhile, from the mid-1930s uh, through the 1950s, um, a moment when the motion picture production code in Hollywood was most enforced, um, and Hollywood films were most censored, um, Hollywood films were incredibly cautious about experimenting with gender roles and drag performance. Uh, needless to say, there is an asymmetry in Hollywood movies. So, um, sorry. So when you had uh, women who appeared mannish, the plot often resolved when they learned how to act in a feminine way. But you did have um, some really interesting uh, instances of men in uh, female impersonation in the 1950s. Uh, these are films that are an entire decade apart. So we have I Was a Male Were Bride in 1949, and in 1959, Billy Wilder's Some Like It Hot, which you may be familiar with. Um, in the 1949 film, Cary Grant, uh, and this is a screen test for him, you, you can see how he looks, he's not incredibly happy, which was also true in the movie. Uh, he plays a gentleman who marries a ball-breaking woman who is a sergeant, who acts as if she were a man, um, and persuades him to, to come on board by disguising himself as a woman, uh, a procedure he finds incredibly degrading. Compare this to 10 years later, where you have Jack Lemmon and Tony Curtis in Some Like It Hot, uh, forced to go on the run and disguise themselves as women to avoid the criminals uh, who were responsible for the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Uh, Jack Lemmon, especially, and also Tony Curtis, uh, become absolutely obsessed with um, the idea of impersonating women. Um, they study them carefully, they're incredibly enthusiastic, and by the end of the film, uh, the Jack Lemmon character uh, Daphne is, is very excited about potentially a future life as a woman. And you may or may not be able to see Jack Lemmon among these different women. Uh, he's a third from uh, the left there, but he fits right in with this all-female community. Moving into the 1960s, inside Hollywood and especially out, uh, we have this breakdown in the production code administration, and filmmakers are experimenting with gender identity drag performers um, and performers in drag in a variety of ways that audiences have never seen before. Uh, for instance, B-movie director William Castle created the film Homicidal, also known as Psychet, um, following Psycho, the previous year, which features a narrative about a male to female transsexual who has to impersonate a man because of the circumstances, um, <laughs> which is complicated enough, but uh, William Castle decided to present in the credits both the woman and the man versions of his character side by side so that the audiences wouldn't be able to decide whether or not the actor was uh, a man or a woman. And he used the gender ambiguous name, John Arliss. So we have uh, both the men and woman versions of the character side by side. Um, you had, of course, Jack Smith's uh, controversial avant-garde film, um, Flaming Creatures with Mario Montez there, and John Waters' trash films like Female Trouble and Pink Flamingos mm -hmm. that featured Divine uh, on the right. Uh, so this is the kind of movement into territory you're probably familiar with. So I'm, uh, I'm guessing that most of you have heard about movies like Tootsie, if not seen them, or Hedwig and the Angry Inch, um, and all those films that came in between. So I want to spend the last couple minutes talking about uh, some of the gender theory uh, and theory related to drag, and also some of the characteristics of drag um, that we are familiar with but maybe haven't talked about much. Uh, drag queen RuPaul famously stated, look, you're born naked and all the rest is drag. Uh, 
This statement, uh, in interesting ways, echoes Simone de Beauvoir's observation in her book, The Second Sex, decades and decades earlier, that one is not born, but rather becomes a woman. These ways of thinking about gender uh, is something that is, on the one hand, a fabrication, a compilation of manners and costuming and postures and attitudes, and on the other hand, a socially constructed phenomena that may be imposed upon us come together in the theory of Judith Butler, who argues that gender identity comes into being as and through what she calls a, quote, stylized repetition of acts, a repetition of bodily gestures and styles that must be constituted again and again, um, a performance that takes place in time. Gender is not, in other words, a stable identity that attaches to an individual, Butler argues, but an imitation, a fantasy of coherent identity, rather uh, a, contingent or ten a contingent or tenuous identity. Butler makes a case that drag, which self-consciously and deliberately foregrounds a recipe for gender, uh, is actually a, a form that, that lets us understand um, the contingency of gender. Uh, the extent to which individuals have uh, a choice as far as gender is concerned, the way they can choose the acts that they perform um, is a huge question, but it's one that RuPaul answers in the affirmative. Not only does RuPaul argue that people are creatures of their own imagination, uh, she has on her show, uh, like Drag University and the other reality show, uh, RuPaul's Drag Race, had drag queens make over heterosexual cis women, biological women, as drag queens, as different kinds of women, which suggests that gender fabrication can be a conscious act. Along this line, uh, Mo Mayer has made the case that the disco group, the village people, uh, who dressed as male stereotypes, like cowboys and construction workers, were, quote, giant queens in male drag, <laughs> whose performances actually cloned or borrowed from bull dagger dykes, which is to say, that lesbians taught the village people how to be men. <laughs> Another important scholar who writes about female impersonation um, and specifically cross-dressing is Marjorie Garver. She argues that cross-dressing isn't just about crossing over between uh, the categories of man and woman. Um, it is, quote, not just a category crisis of male and female, she argues, but the crisis of category itself. Cross-dressing, Garber argues, challenges us to look at and reassess the utility and the ethics of operating according to binary categories, like black and white, like men and women, like gay and straight, when we use them to organize uh, the social life, um, to organize our society. Moreover, to cross-dress is, for Garber, a way of recollecting a primal moment or a primal scene before uh, we experience gender category for ourselves. So a primal moment of gender confusion. Um, when we see cross-dressing, uh, we're reminded of that moment and we realize that other part, the other potential place we could have been is something that we lost. So those theories can help us think a little bit about gender and drag, but I wanna end pretty quickly by discussing other aspects of drag um, that bring up issues besides gender. One of them is lip syncing, which we typically associate with, uh, with drag uh, performances, but actually only appeared in the late 50s and early 60s, when, as I mentioned earlier, clubs were so harassed and so constrained in their ability to uh, kind of make the bottom line that they gradually reduced uh, orchestras to accompany their singers and played canned music, and it was only a step away from there to using canned vocals as well. And at that moment, there was enormous tension between talented singers and people who were simply lip syncing on stage. Um, but by the 1980s and to the present, an aesthetics of lip syncing has developed. Um, and it's become an integral part of some drag performances. One uh, aspect of lip syncing is that it expands the practices of citationality, allowing performers to situate themselves within a broader framework of popular culture. In many cases, it even takes us back to another era or a more distant past to a different kind of celebrity or stardom, uh, connecting us to celebrity icon, icons like Marlena Dietrich or Judy Garland or Barbara Streisand. Um, and in the case of Garland, for example, connecting us to a kind of passion and tragedy um, of our past. It enables its audience to have something like uh, 
a live wire or connection to history and a connection to past audiences. Um, and it activates memories in us that we never actually had. Uh, the second uh, aspect of drag I wanted to bring up really quickly is the idea of royalty and royal bodies, which of course we hear in the terms drag king and drag queen. Uh, I was going to show you a picture of Andy Warhol here. Um, he experimented with drag, obviously, um, and believed that drag was a way of working uh, and reworking our outward appearances remaking out our identities and um, presenting our desires. And Warhol found a similarity um, between the drag queen and the royal queen, both of which he photographed. They were both what he thought of as glittering images um, for an audience that could keep people away from scrutinizing them. So they had a certain distance um, around them. That's why Warhol, um, and later many who have curated this work, have put together um, his images of uh, royal families and royal women and drag queens. Um, so here you have uh, his famous drag queen, Candy Darling, um, and uh, an Italian socialite, Princess Pignatelli, right next to each other. And you may see some similarities in the images themselves. Um, in the ballroom scene, which I'll just mention in a minute, critics have argued that a royal body, um, or uh, someone we might call divine, marks an individual as an authority, um, a person in control of organizing and giving meaning to space, to gender, to class identities, and making them on their own terms. Um, so drag kings and queens as a kind of human royalty with self-creative rights, with a space of entitlement, can suggest to us um, possibilities for thinking about what agency, self-authorship, and perhaps most importantly, what bodily integrity might look like. Uh, what the world would be like if every individual had the prerogative to determine how others saw them and the kind of esteem, both self-esteem and respect from others, would emerge from that agency. Um, I'll just quickly pass through um, voguing, which you may be familiar with as well. It's associated with the Harlem ballroom scene, most famously portrayed in uh, Jenny Livingston's Paris is Burning from 1991, which is a documentary that you absolutely must see if you um, ever take a women's studies class and that you probably want to see if you want to learn more about the Harlem ballroom scene. Uh, voguing is a style of dance that's angular, almost jerky in its movements, and its emergence paralleled the emergence of breakdancing in the late 1970s. Um, and in uh, the Harlem ballroom scene, we had mostly uh, Latinas and uh, young black Americans who participated um, in comp competitions um, competitions that were um, organized according to houses, um, houses which were intergenerational, um, which often took their names from uh, figures uh, of who were famous from fashion, so there was a House of Chanel, House of Armani, uh, and so on. Um, and the contest included not only contests for best drag queen, but also for, uh, say, executive realness, or for town and country, so different kinds of images. Um, houses gave the performers a family name. Um, they created a maternal lineage, and uh, they frequently kind of passed the lineage through the mother and on uh, for generations after. So participate, participants in the Harlem, Harlem ballroom culture, and here's one example of uh, Pepper LaBeja in the House of LaBeja, and another um, in an executive contest. They suggest uh, alternative models um, for family and for community. Um, and most recently, there's fantastic uh, scholarship that hypothesizes that there's a connection between the emergence of the Harlem ballroom scene and the arrival of hundreds and thousands of Cubans to New York practicing Santeria in the <coughs> early 1960s, where the structure of uh, Santeria influenced the structure of ballroom communities. I'd be happy to talk more about that. Um, and I'm just going to end by mentioning a little bit about political activism in drag. And it's important to note that drag performance and drag performers have and can and will continue to play a role in political activism in the United States. RuPaul once led a demonstration against the Ku Klux Klan in Atlanta where she remarked that uh, she, quote, felt an epiphany of love's power and the power of drag in bringing people together and transcending prejudice. How can drag transcend prejudice by acting as a conduit for love?
I don't know, I think it's a fascinating question. Um, and there are other moments where dragon politics came together, uh, noticeably in the person of Jose Soria, who was uh, a World War II veteran and performed at the Black Cat Club in San Francisco and also was an LGBT activist. Uh, he went on to be the first um, openly gay uh, a candidate to run for political office in 1961 in California. Um, and a third example is Joan Jett Black, who ran as a queer nation candidate uh, for municipal office in the 1991 Chicago mayoral race. She used her drag persona and highly publicized events like shopping street, like excuse me, like shopping sprees and the Gold Coast District in Chicago. Um, and here you have her as a part of the Black Pant Party. Um, so she used drag to think differently about what politics should look like and what politicians should do. Um, so these examples that I'll end with of political bravery, courage, and audacious activism can encourage us to reimagine what our bodies can do in the service of a politics we believe in. Thank you. Now I would like to introduce Vivica C. Cox, the creative mind behind Vivica C. Cox Presents Series and Durham's Drag Diva. All I know is I'm not looking at you until the lights change. Now you can't see me. <clears throat> How are you all doing? I want you to know that you don't need to see me to love me, but when you do see me, you will love me. So I hope you've had a very educational experience. Um, they told me to keep it family friendly. I'm looking for children. I see at least one, so I will. <laughs> I will take compliments in the form of whistles. <laughs> yes, Mama. Oh, she's here. <laughs> she follows me around. It's kind of creepy. But seriously, did you enjoy your lecture? That's, that's so very awesome. I want you to know that this is absolutely amazing. Um, it's not often that as a drag performer you get to walk into a library. <laughs> now, I've been known to read a few things and usually they're humans and other drag queens. And if you don't get that joke, please, please see Paris is Burning and they will tell you about reading or watch RuPaul's Drag Race and they will talk about the library being open, okay? <laughs> it's been a long time since Vivica was in a library. I did have to go study a gay history book today. How many of you listen to Frank Stacio and the State of Things? <laughs> there was one thing my mother always taught me and that was to not have too much pride. So if I'm wrong, tell me so I can be right because I like to be right. That is the one thing you should know about me. But I'm not just gonna stand up here and talk to you and let the electrical outlets trip me. <laughs> I'm going to actually spend some time talking about um, who our other performers are. So you know who I am. I'm Vivica C. Cox. I'm Durham's Drag Diva and host of Vivica C. Cox Presents. Uh, we do amateur shows and we do also other, comp other performances that are pretty entertaining if you ask me. <laughs> so I might be a diva, but we have a lot of skirt going on. <laughs> but we have three other performers here as well. And one is a just seasoned pageant queen. Her name is Vivian Vaughn. I love, is that my coworker? Hey! 
<laughs> um, I love Vivian because she likes V's as much as I do. So up next is, go well, up first is going to be Vivian Vaughn, your seasoned pageant queen. And she's going to show you a little something different from what I would do, and I am so excited to see what she serves this evening. I'm going to do what I do best. Be pretty. I don't understand why everyone says to me, you a funny queen, when I work so hard to be a pretty queen. When in fact, I'm both. Listen, it's a long dress. And I had timed it perfectly how long I was going to be in it based on the number of songs and how long I was going to talk. Time yes, time is running out, honey. <laughs> time is running out. <laughs> <laughs> Woo, girl. <gasps> it's summer in North Carolina, and I'm looking like I'm going to the winter formal. I started thinking about Hogwarts and how I was gonna make a Hogwarts joke because it was family friendly. Then I thought, ha, family friendly. And then I got lost in my mind and then I couldn't tell a joke. And it was really sad. <laughs> and you're trying to figure out how did I get to Hogwarts in the first place? Because I'm a nerd and I heard winter formal and I thought about that moment when Hermione went to the <laughs> winter formal. <laughs> with the really cute guy instead of Ron. I mean, Ron is cute in his own unique way. <laughs> y'all, listen, you all have homework to do. Take out your pen and paper. There are things that you must watch and do between now and the next time you see me. And the sad part is I'm gonna remember your face and you ain't gonna know me on the street. And I'm gonna ask you, have you watched Paris is Burning? Yes, yes you have. So you know what reading is, you know what shade is. Okay, so you can now graduate to the intermediate level. I'll get back to you in a second. Are you ready? With this mic? You want my mic? I was in the middle of something. I'll get back to you. If you listen to the state of things today, you know you need to watch Tu Wong Fu. Okay? That should have been the remedial class. Because I watched that when I was a little kid. Probably shouldn't have, but whatever. <laughs> Intermediate level, Priscilla. Okay? kids here? Uh, what's the next intermediate course? The master's class we can't talk about here. We'll talk later, okay? <laughs> <laughs> the intermediate level will also include season one of RuPaul's Drag Race. Yeah. Only season one. <laughs> that was low budget. I think the library has more money. That was a read. Again, if you don't know what that is, watch Paris is Burning. <laughs> they don't really look like they're ready for my mic because they're still over there discussing. <laughs> my jewels? Honey, I bought them. Oh, thank you. 
<laughs> no, seriously. I saw them, I liked them, I paid. <laughs> there are some drag queens who won't pay. <laughs> but my mama did raise me right. Seriously, they just took the laptop to a new location. I told y'all they weren't ready for me. I told you. <laughs> no, seriously, um, they're just big and sparkly. You saw that Vivian had on bigger jewelry. I don't have to compensate for anything, so. Because they better have my music on or else I'm gonna need bigger jewels. I told you this was a family-friendly event. <laughs> I'm trying to keep one eye on them. I don't have anything else to do with my other eye. I'm sorry. <laughs> I really don't. I was trying to think, well, I could look at... <sighs> I love you, though. It's okay. <laughs> what else do you want to know about my outfit? Okay, someone asked me if I made it. I made it rain. <laughs> I do know how to sew, but I did not make this outfit. Another question? I guess. Turns out they make wedding shoes in my size, but I don't know which bride got married in these. You know, maybe it's for a bridesmaid, but maybe she should reevaluate her life choices. I just, I don't know. Um, but we're gonna have more time for Q and A at the end um, of this. So I'll stop with the questions and I'll ask who came from the farthest away. I love that like space filler. You know, they're getting desperate when they ask who came the farthest away. <laughs> from the farthest away. He did? Does he live next door? You came from Florida to see me? Was it worth the drive? <laughs> oh, that's so precious. I'm so glad we could deliver. <laughs> Listen, this is not the worst thing that has ever happened to me. One time at my own show, my music wouldn't even play. Just wouldn't play. So the, you know, the audio guy put on a whole different song, a whole different version. And he was like, this is it. And I was like, that ain't it. He just kept playing. And he just kept playing. So I just made it work. I was just like. started doing leap splits and breaking shoes and things like that and everybody was like that was amazing and I, I went thank you <laughs> so you really just have to kind of go with the flow because um, they working really hard up there so <laughs> I'm trying to you know give them time and bear with them I'm getting no indication of what's going on so that means keep talking right Seen any good movies lately? <laughs> no, seriously, I need something to do tonight because I'm clearly not working. <laughs> do you have any shows coming up? Oh, do I have any shows coming up? Oh, did I place you over there or something? <laughs> no, I don't. I'm done. I can't pick it up. I can't pick that up. <laughs> Thank you kindly. <laughs> I am sewn into this dress tonight. I am sorry. I am not getting down for nothing. If y'all say run, I will rip the dress and go because I love my life more than my jewels and my dress. But I can barely walk. I cannot squat. And I'm sure as hell I'm, sure I'm not sitting. <laughs> but I do have a show coming up that is not family friendly. Um, it is my old school drag and dance night. Uh, it starts at 11 p.m. on Friday, July 11th at the bar, dot, 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 Durham. It, where's the bar? It's on Rigsby by Full Steam and Motorco and Surf Club. 
Yeah, it's like that really gay place among all the straight things. Yeah. Um, but it really is called The Bar. Dot, dot, dot. There are people behind me and I can't see them because of the hair. And I don't know what's happening. Oh, they're trying something different now. Let's see how that works. Was it tonight or? <laughs> <laughs> On July 11th, it starts at 11 p.m. I look better at night, honey. <laughs> so you can look better in the morning, right? Okay. Well, we have different lives. <laughs> but it's totally worth it. Um, <laughs> we have a very large age range um, <laughs> at my shows from like 18 to 24. <laughs> I'm kidding. 26. No, seriously, I'm kidding. My, uh, my retired relatives will show up. So if they can show up to my shows, what you doing with your Friday night? Granted, I cooked them breakfast the next morning, so it is what it is. <laughs> I had something funny to say, but then we got on this tangent about 11 p.m. And <laughs> I just, just went down that road. Then I have an amateur competition on August 9th, at, it's, which is a Saturday at 10 p.m. But please understand, while I am punctual, not all of my performers are. Who are my tech people? We don't need to go there. How many times can I milk that joke? <laughs> you like for the rest of the night until I turn that music on. That's what you just said. Um, seriously, that one is an amateur competition. People have a lot of fun at those shows. Um, our third performer tonight was actually discovered at one of those shows. And you will see that you can find some amazing talent at an amateur show. Because the one thing about the drag world is there's not a, always opportunity to get on stage. And so you might have a passion and you might be talented, but if no one is letting you get on stage, and that's how Derm is different. We believe that anyone who wants to should be able to get on stage. Doesn't mean we're gonna ask him to perform again, because... <laughs> I got a brand, okay? <laughs> I cannot be having people come on my stage twice if they didn't serve the first time. Does anyone know what serving is? Why do I randomly get loud? Yes, you know what serving is. Did we get three claps to serving? Okay, now how many of y'all who just clapped actually know what serving is? Or how many of you just clapped to clap? <sighs> right now, I am serving ballroom, gown, lounge, realness. Ugh. To serve means to deliver, to give, to showcase, to provide, usually in the context of entertainment or among your girlfriends. And yes, sometimes your girlfriends have different anatomy. <laughs> Family friendly. <laughs> so right there, you can say I was serving ballroom gown lounge realness because I'm in a ball gown. I was lounging and it was real. <laughs> I think on the state of things, I may have referenced executive realness. I did, I did, thank you. That is when an earring falls off because you swung your ear. Oh, no, it stayed, it stayed, okay. Um, executive realness is where you put on a business suit and look real cute. All right, right, you get it now, right? But can you imagine a drag queen in a business suit? That's right, because we can do anything we want, honey. Oh, we're gonna go with what we have. But 
you enjoyed your little moment, didn't you? You're going to try the mic? Jasmine Brooks! They can't hold me down. <laughs> they won't let me have a mic, I'll use my voice. And continue putting on that earring I was trying to put on discreetly. So every time Did I just drop something like my panties? <laughs> Another perk of being a drag queen, you drop things and boys pick them up. <laughs> the music going. I'm not gonna do it. <laughs> Michelle, do question. What? So we're we're trying one more thing. We sorry for this. So why don't we have a couple of Q and A's with our scholar? Where's Michelle? Where did you? There she. So we'll take a couple of questions and we'll do the next performer as soon as we try this last thing. So I will. Um, let me have this mic. This is our best mic. Can I have this mic back? Okay. Oh, you need this mic? Okay. Okay. So we're going to ask you to repeat the questions. You know, I was trying to do a million things, and oh, so the question is: Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence, where do they fit in this whole um, kind of genealogy that I provided for you? And and I first was uh, prefacing um, my answer. I'm not sure if I really have an answer um, with a statement that I was just trying to cover a huge span of time. Do you want to come up for a second? Yeah. Um, thank you. So do you want to talk a little bit about the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence and how you see them fitting in, or why you think they're really kind of important to this genealogy? And can you give us your name as well? Hi. Um, hi, I am Andrew, and I'm a student at Duke University. And um, Sisters of Perpetual, Perpetual Indulgences was a group that was founded in San Francisco. And they came out of a, a time when, in which the Roman Catholic Church was really oppressive to people in the Bay Area. And so they start dressing up as caricatures of nuns. And they had the white faces and the medieval painted faces. And what they did was they did outreach and counseling and um, safe sex um, promotion and HIV AIDS awareness. And they continue to grow today. And there's chapters all over the United States. And they're sort of a, a really helpful community group. They're sort of like the houses in Harlem. Um, with the ballroom community, and they do a lot of social work and a lot of social activism on the part of the gay community. So you might place them um, in the vein of the activists that I mentioned, or uh, along with the Harlem ball ballroom scene, in terms of having a kind of community, acting as a community force. Thank you. <laughs> Are there other questions? Yeah. Um, so as an Americanist, I can just refuse to answer that question, <laughs> but <laughs> the question was, so how can we compare the history of drag in the United States to how drag works in other countries or the history or genealogy of drag in other countries? And I'm a little bit familiar with drag in Great Britain, and there is a different kind of openness, or there has been historically, to female impersonation. Uh, even in the early 19th century, I mean, late 19th century, early 20th century, there's a famous case, um, a man named Bolton, 
who, dressed as uh, a woman on the street, um, actually lived as uh, a woman and was ultimately arrested. This was around the time of Oscar Wilde's trial. Uh, he went to court um, and uh, because of his realness, because of the preciseness and the beauty of his impersonation um, of a woman, um, thespians all across London went to the trial. And when uh, he was acquitted, they stood up and yelled, bravo. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, you know, across the 20th century, there's a kind of interesting and more expansive um, story of drag in, uh, in England. Um, in other countries, um, as I'm sure you know, there are all these different versions of female impersonation on the stage that have to do with different forms of theater um, and different traditions. Um, but the history of drag in multiple countries across the globe is not something I can trace today. Thank you for your question. Other questions? Are we set? Do we have any drag kings tonight? Okay, so you will presently see a drag king. Yeah, so someone like Gladys Bentley, who I showed, someone might refer to her uh, or as a drag king, right? Um, so yeah, a term that goes along. Other questions? Yeah, all the way to the back. Do you want to come up for a second? I, I so I can hear you a little better. <laughs> Who are you? <laughs> Wait, yeah, sir, can you ask your question? Yeah, so I was just asking um, if you could comment on the history of the word tranny as an identity that some drag queens and female impersonators take on. So like tranny is in transsexual, um, or tranny is, is in a more recent usage. Yes. Yeah. I'm not really sure what you are interested in having me say. Um, uh, well, there's the current controversy going on between the transgender community mm -hmm. and the drag community, but also there's some drag queens. <laughs> okay, so if we're talking about reclamation, um, as a form of identity politics. Um, I'm, I'm not here to kind of side on one side or another, and people uh, kind of choose different categories and identities and vocabularies over time. So you do have the reclamation of terms like queer, terms that I'm not gonna say in a family-friendly performance in case they uh, would offend some people. But the idea here is, of course, that any reclamation of an identity label could offend somebody. Um, yeah, I mean, and I think it's true in, in, or the reason that there's a controversy surrounding the term tranny. Um, do you have a, uh, some ideas you want to express about that? Not so much, no. <laughs> no? Oh gosh, no? Uh, I was wondering, like, has it been going, I didn't know if you were familiar, is there a history of this, or is it just a recent development in the past few years? Do you want to talk at all about? Honey, I ain't been paying attention. <laughs> 